before the pandemic, uh, fertility was declining around the world, uh, more slowly in sub-Saharan Africa than elsewhere. And there were many countries with uh, negative population growth, particularly in Europe, but some elsewhere. And uh, life expectancy was rising, fertility falling, and the populations around the world are in the process of aging. Um, but if we look at it globally, the growth rate of population now is below 1% per year. Uh, fertility has dropped a lot on, on average. There, More than half the world's population is, is living in countries where fertility is below replacement level, which in the long run would lead to population decline if there weren't migration. It's really a question of how rapidly fertility will decline in sub-Saharan Africa. And the optimistic view is that um, girls and women are more educated and so on, which is happening there. Fertility will just come down as it has elsewhere in the world. So for some reason, this process has been a little slower in sub-Saharan Africa, but um, it, the same processes seem to be at work. But really, there isn't a big surprise. If you look at the trends, they've just been, you know, the population growth rate has been declining and it just happens to have crossed zero now, but it's not like it suddenly fell off a cliff or something. And the same with, with fertility. Well, fertility was already at about 1.3 births per woman or something. Now maybe it's 1.18. Why does this matter economically? Declining population or slower population growth so our labor force growth, this leads to slower growth in GDP, pretty much on a one-to-one -one basis. And in the past, the labor force has been growing at about one and a half percent per year in China. In the future, it's going to be declining at about one percent per year. So that's a swing of two and a half percent. And that's pretty much going to translate into a swing, a reduction of two and a half percent in GDP. Well, for the world, it, it's a big deal because China is a driver of the world economy. And if GDP grows more slowly, then demand for uh, goods produced in the rest of the world will drive and so on. But in terms of the welfare of the Chinese people, it really isn't, to my mind, about GDP growth. It's about growth in GDP per capita. And since the population is shrinking, uh, GDP per capita um, may rise, may decline, but it's not going to decline as much as GDP proper. Another piece of it is the redistribution and the systems for redistributing income from working age people to children and the elderly. And that's where population aging really has a bite. And that's where you see a lot of concern uh, about the uh, public pension system, what in the U.S. we'd call the social security system uh, in China, and the fact that uh, it may go bust uh, by 2035. You see that number bandied about. The low fertility in China and the fertility decline and now negative population growth, it's not mostly because of the one-child policy. It's, it's mostly just economic development. Careful analyses find that about uh, maybe a third of the decline in the 1970s, when fertility really dropped a lot, maybe a third of the decline was due to the one-child policy, and two-thirds was just due to normal economic development. I think the, the consequences of the one-child policy are exaggerated in, in the media. We, countries all over the world have tried to uh, incentivize higher fertility, it mostly has no effect. Um, what does seem to have an effect and what East Asian countries haven't really done is to um, support the family, uh, support women's work through state child care, through guarantees of getting back to your job after, after a break, perhaps for uh, uh, child uh, birth leave for the husbands as well as the wives. And these kinds of things seem to have made a difference in, in Europe, for example. But I would su suggest for, for China, and I'd suggest for the U.S. also, where we haven't done it, is to build automatic stabilizers 
into the public pension system. And many European countries have done this. I think more than half have done it in one way or another. The idea is then that as life expectancy goes up, the age of retirement sort of automatically rises. As fertility goes down, which is an independent cause of population aging, then uh, there are automatic adjustments both to benefits and to taxes. And so you, you establish a set of rules for the pension system, and you, you would need a broad support for this, but countries have succeeded, like Sweden and Germany, for example. Uh, you establish a set of rules that then share the pain in a fair way uh, across the generations. Well, you set this up, and then people understand it. They know what they're facing. Adjustments are automatic. It's not a political football and so on. So I'm very much in favor of that. That's not to say that every society has to make the same trade-off between how long do you want to work, how, would, how long do you have in retirement, and so on. But you have to make those decisions realizing what the costs are for other generations and make a choice. 